Warm greetings to one and all. This is Aishwarya S. Menon, Research Officer at the Chennai Center for China Studies. Uh, I welcome you all to the fifth tone, an interview series launched by C3S. It is a, a one on one conversation between two or more participants with an interviewer asking pertinent questions on pressing issues that are related to China and its engagements with other state actors. The main goal is to interact with highly qualified and uh, seasoned experts to receive credible information to study China comprehensively. And uh, this uh, it's aptly titled a fifth tone, uh, as in Mandarin, the fifth tone is called to be a neutral tone. And for Mandarin learners, it causes great confusion. And this is why we've likened it to understanding the international affairs that China has, because it is in a constant state of flux. In uh, today's um, C3S fifth tone, the theme of this interview is half the sky is the limit, women empowerment in China. Um, China's recent rapid economic growth has paved way for new opportunities and new challenges for women. While the growth of the industrial sector has given millions of women various opportunities to earn a living, women lag far behind men in access to land, credit, and decent jobs, uh, despite a growing body of research that shows that enhancing women's economic options boosts national economies. Women who come from rural or less developed areas often lack formal higher education or professional experiences and are thus susceptible to exploitation and discrimination. The China of the 21st century often overlooks uh, women's specific needs and priorities. And as far as gender equality in China's public policy goes, women are found at a disadvantage because they are not backed by specific women-centered actions for implementation, along with necessary funding to be empowered citizens. With this backdrop, I would like to introduce our august speaker for today's session, Dr. Usha Chandran, Assistant Professor, Center for China and Southeast Asian Studies, School of Language, Literature and Cultural Studies, JNU, adjunct fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. She holds a BA, MA, MPhil, and PhD from the Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, JNU. She has an advanced uh, diploma from Beijing Language and Culture University, Beijing. She has lived in China for more than four years, and she, uh, she's keen on using Chinese language skills to understand various facets of China, specifically the issues of gender. Her major research interests and publications in Chinese and English language include gender issues in China and comparison with India and the West, comparing women's subjectivity of Lu Sun, Tagore, and Virginia Woolf's uh, literary works, birth of new women in modern China, women's role in politics in China, gender governance, role of women in language and practicing gender, gendered impact of COVID-19 comparing India and China, and exploring the sociological methodologies to study Chinese society. She's currently working on an edited volume titled Gender in Language Expression. Welcome, uh, Dr. Uh, Usha Chandran, ma'am, uh, to the C3S Fifth Tone interview series. I thank you very much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to your valuable insight on the topic at hand. Welcome once again, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you for having yes, me. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I'll uh, get right into the questions. Um, the first question, ma'am, that I have for you is the theme of the International Women's Day 2021. The theme was hashtag challenge. Uh, Ma'am, what does this theme mean according to you? And uh, do you think Chinese women can fully embrace this theme given the existing social, cultural, and political setup of the People's Republic of China? Thank you. Thank you, Aishwarya, so much for that uh, introduction. And actually, uh, and really, it's a pleasure for me because I think, as far as I remember, this could be the first experience of such an interview for me. So thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, as as for the theme, uh, choose to challenge. I think every woman can relate to uh, choose to challenge because we are uh, facing the difficulties like almost all women in the entire world are 
you know uh, some time or the other are faced with uh, certain uh, difficulties uh, for the very reason of being a woman and therefore uh, uh, whether how many of them are actually having the uh, you know uh, courage or the situation or the encouragement to uh, challenge is is, is quite uh, you know and maybe only a few percentage are able to challenge of course increasingly there are uh, changes but uh, there are so many times that people are not able to women especially are not able to challenge so for for centuries you know women have uh, been silent without even knowing that uh, they have the right to choose and uh, uh, but uh, in the past uh, century perhaps with the increasing sense of awareness as a result of the struggle by women in, uh, you know uh, women uh, whether it's in academics or in activism or uh, in daily life uh, there's been a lot of uh, struggle and the women have themselves tried to come out of their uh, uh, you know uh, the challenge and that they can actually choose the fact that they can actually choose they trying to they trying to embrace this so uh, definitely i would say that uh, uh, in the past uh, few decades there have been increasingly uh, uh, you know the uh, one one would say that with the social media there have been increasing chances and increasing opportunities for women to challenge against the discriminatory practices and the stereotypes on them not just the discriminatory practices but also to identify uh, the stereotypes uh, that are there uh, uh, on them so in china as in other parts of the world it has been you know a very difficult a very difficult challenge sometimes even impossible with the predator having some political backing or uh, or or dominating nature even that is enough yet we have witnessed women challenging you know and coming out and speaking and there are several cases like in the recent years if i'm talking about like uh, perhaps me too movement is one of the most uh, uh, you know um, uh one of the most uh, you can say most uh, influential uh, movement throughout the world and uh, it has influenced china even though it started late in 2018 perhaps around 2018 in china but there have been so many cases where people have where women have come out and uh, uh, you know it started with uh, students who were outside china who went to study outside and they came out with uh, cases when they were in china they were uh, you know sexually molested or so they that's how it started however later on we we find more and more instances of students uh, women in side china also coming out with uh, you know uh, especially in the social media and we see people coming out with these stories we have a very famous case of shiens who was a 35 year old writer um a screen writer who was molested by a tv host who was a celebrated tv host so uh, you know uh, you you you'll be surprised that you know it's we perhaps outside china we don't know a lot and we tend to speculate that you know because it's a autocratic rule and perhaps there won't be many instances of uh, such uh, practice but there are and they they are facing uh, prosecution they are they are facing all kinds of uh, isolation and attacks but there still there are so many cases even uh, you know the, the monk headed by uh, the head of the buddhist association is also accused of being too much so i think uh, i think if this women are coming out in challenges so yes if you say if you ask me how how uh, you know if chinese people women are embracing uh, this uh, uh, particular hashtag choose to challenge then i think many of them are I mean, not. I will not say everyone, but I'm the same case throughout the world. It's right? not even in India, or for that matter, anywhere in the world. So we all know that it's a struggle. It's a long way to go before we can claim that you know, all women are able to embrace such a uh, because, and you know the reasons. Because there's a lot of uh, you know stigmat stigmatizing such women. There is political uh, pressure. There is shaming, public shaming. and uh, also economic repercussions of such women who do not have any support uh, economically sometimes their their jobs are taken away and you know leave alone uh, fighting such a uh, um, uh, for economic sustenance for fighting such a legal battle but also for sustaining oneself 
it is very uh, difficult. But what is interesting is that, and I would be really, very really positive about this, is increasingly there are, uh, uh, you know, there are debates, uh, especially in social media, on issues related to women. There are women who start the debate. There are people who are definitely also uh, uh, supporting this particular idea of uh, uh, stereo, uh, like um, uh, choosing to challenge or not to stereotype women. But there are uh, so many uh, who are actually uh, reiterating the traditional ideas and stereotyping image on them. So there, all kinds of things are there, but it is there. You know, it's not hidden anymore. Um, definitely, ma'am. I think uh, when we look at even political organizations or corporate boardrooms or any in any, uh, any field, uh, we find that women in China particularly, they have a limited say in decisions that affect them. And um, like, according to you, ma'am, what are some of the measures that are needed to open up the space for women to uh, engage and to be um, active participants in the decisions that uh, affect them and how can they realize their uh, entrepreneurial and leadership potential? Some thoughts on that, ma'am? I think the participation of women uh, in formal waged employment, I think we will be, okay, but when we look at China, we can say, we can, you know, in the past few decades, we can see there's a, there's a, a downfall, especially in the past few decades. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are comparing with other countries, then uh, it's a bit different because unlike other Asian countries, in China, uh, uh, women's participation in labor, uh, labor wage labor started uh, quite early, like during the 50s and the 60s. When people, when uh, the, the Communist Party of China established the, the uh, PRC, they were very clear that women have to come out and start working. So, uh, but with the reforms, what happened was that there's an increase in competition and open discrimination of women. And large number of women were forced to shift from formal to informal employment. It's not that they are not employed anymore, but they are employed with less wages, uh, more working hours and less uh, in bad working conditions. So one can see that the percentage of working women is uh, uh, though relatively much higher in China as compared to other Asian countries. But they are mostly clustered in informal and part-time uh, low-wage employment with poor conditions and unprotected uh, and insecure work. Now, needless to say, women's presence in the uh, position of power is also quite scarce, like as you mentioned. So it was only during the, uh, you know, uh, last year that uh, there was this, uh, the NPC had um, passed the sexual prevention of sexual harassment in, uh, in the workplace. And its implementation could definitely take more time. So such laws, I would say that it only aspires to solve the temporary problem. I would not say temporary, but the existing problem or the possibilities that people can actually report on abuse or that to have a way out to, uh, you know, solve the problem if they are sexually being harassed in, 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 in or even if uh, and this is I'm really talking about sexual harassment, not discrimination yet, but even for sexual harassment, the bill was passed last year. So you can imagine how much time it will take for uh, to become a reality, right? So, uh, but I would say that you know all these measures are important. I mean, definitely very important. But the gendered mindset of the people that has to change. So how will that change? And uh, I think uh, generally people do not want to be dictated by women. So women in power or position uh, are always finding it difficult. Uh, to uh, to make their subordinates work and also men do not like women to be their equals. So they, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, problems at so many fronts. So the, uh, the gender power relations which actually start at home with, with uh, people at home, with, whether it's husband, father, it is actually, it gets translated. It is it's a, in, in society. So it's a constant struggle. You can see that everywhere. So the private patriarchy, that is the patriarchy at home, changes its nature to public patriarchy, where when women step out of the house and start working. So with the entire, uh, it's something like a, uh, you know, it's an unsaid uh, thing that, you know, when women step out, then this patriarchal, uh, uh, patriarchal, uh, you would say the structure gets carried everywhere she goes. So the male and the other women were generally submissive. They all come together to, uh, 
you know to uh, to create obstacles for the women to uh, rise uh, uh, as per her talent or so therefore uh, they come together to subordinate the talent of it so this is then uh, in turn supported by the patriarchal the by state patriarchy when the state do not do enough to uh, uh, protect the rights of women their 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 policies and their laws are inadequate to protect women so it's a circle so the private patriarchy changing into public patriarchy and then uh, to state patriarchy and this circle keeps continuing it's it's a i mean it's a wheel you know? it's just uh, you know, So it, it, it's it's very small because it's that's what they know it's been going. So it has to be broken. This pattern has to be broken. So therefore, all measures adopted to protect the rights of women at work would actually just cater to uh, uh, or help her fight uh, the discrimination or uh, uh, harassment that she's facing. But these me- there are uh, but these measures are um, uh, something which would keep working on. but the deep rooted mindset of male patriarchy uh, male superiority sorry should be something which is which should be addressed right from uh, the economic and the social level as long as women are economically subordinate to men by being engaged in low wage employment like you can see women uh, doing nursing women mostly nurses are women you will see all these uh, factory uh, front line workers in so and but their supervisor would be a man and the doctor is mostly a man so you can see how um, uh, you know women are clustered in these caretaking um, and uh, low wage and uh, poor condition uh, long working hours such works they are engaged in these uh, employment and therefore uh, the um, uh, there is a kind of a uh, social uh, at, a, at even at the social level because of their economic uh, uh, subordination because they are always a secondary earner even if her, the wife is working she would be the secondary earner not the primary earner of the house so as long as economically she is weaker even if she is working but economically she is a secondary earner and therefore there will be subordination and that is why when we say that you know uh, 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 sorry coming back to that economic and social so when this kind of an equation is maintained like economically women are subordinate and therefore socially also they are subordinate so the society is collectively uh, creating obstructions and you know creating this uh, 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 pattern where women are um, invariably going uh, and working in positions uh, where they do not have uh, uh, power or the power of decision making where they don't they, they cannot decide what what will happen to them and how they can uh, you know uh, how they can negotiate with their work for example i'll i'll just give you an example in in china when uh, recently with the wuhan uh, virus uh, uh, when the uh, covid virus was spread in entire wuhan there were so many volunteers who were actually uh, the, the women uh, the nurses working most of them 99.9% are uh, you know uh, nurses uh, are women and the doctors are invariably and even the uh, there are uh, women doctors with is very less percentage but yeah but, uh, around 30 around 30% of the doctors are uh, women doctors but then uh, the people in power that is those who will do, those who are the medical supervisors they were invariably male who would decide what is a medical equipment which can be taken in or which should be demanded so they did not demand for a sanitary for sanitary napkins for women because all everything was closed the shops were closed they were not allowed to go back home and they had to be in the hospital and they was they were also staying back in places where which was arranged for them so there was no way out there were women who did not have sanitary napkins to use when they were when they were having the periods and because the supervisors decided it was not an important medical acute medical uh, requirement then they were and through social media when they uh, expressed their problems and everything there were so many don- donators and they donated sanitary napkins but it was not accepted but with this reason that you know so what i'm trying to say is that when women are not when women are there every, everywhere they are working but they are not in positions of power and therefore they are not able to uh, 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 you know um, uh, decide or take women centric or uh, or take uh, uh, such uh, you know measures which would actually help them at work and things like that so the but the society at large is actually contributing in maintaining such a pattern to uh, low economic value and low economic social value so therefore uh, you know uh, 
the with this social economic and social uh, kind of a setup there's a political power also i'm trying to bring in the uh, politics here because uh, and that's how the gender power relation is maintained so the, the political power is again denied by giving women the position to uh, of decision making the power of decision making everywhere like i just said the hospital so therefore Uh, and whenever when when whenever a woman is actually coming out of this pattern then she socially stigmatized and you know the uh, example of uh, left to wing women or uh, there's so many other terms like manly women old women so they there if you look at this chinese social media there is so many it's very interesting the way people discuss such uh, uh, issues they say that you know women are uh, such women left to wing women or even manly women there is this hmm, hands so there is a term for manly women. as like you know like in hindi we have this uh, gabru mard or something like that we have this in punjabi so uh, an opposite of that trying to say that these women who are very independent and they can you know take care of themselves so they don't need a man so therefore they are just good for uh, uh, you know if you can make the um, uh, good for friendship she is a good girlfriend but not a good wife because then you know she might need you any time because basically she doesn't need a man in her life So there are such uh, discussions which are which pe- where people are actually socially stigmatizing such women and putting them uh, in a certain box in a certain category only because they are not fitting into the social role of being an ideal wife, an ideal mother, and therefore these terms have come into being. So when we look at these uh, rules, I just mentioned I have some uh, things in here that. Uh, Uh, like you know, the first ever civil code, uh, uh, which obliges the companies to adapt adopt measures like, for preventing and responding. Uh, it came only in twenty. It, it was implemented in January first, twenty twenty one. So you can imagine, even the domestic violence uh, was implemented only in twenty sixteen. You know? So, uh, and of course, these are all um, uh, a result of uh, uh, long standing struggle. Yeah. Um, ma'am, you stated some very important points there, and I just wanted to uh, specifically ask you: uh, when it comes to the political setup, when we, if we just um, type on Google, uh, you know, the number of women who are represented uh, in uh, political parties or anything in India, at least the the representation is a lot better. But when we look at uh, China, you'll find one woman among just uh, an ocean of men. and it's uh, quite uh, it's quite alarming to see such a uh, such a big uh, powerful country like china having very low representation like that so i mean now i feel like chinese government is making some amount of efforts to augment uh, gender equality um, but uh, what are areas that you feel they have improved in uplifting women in basically in, like investing in them like you mentioned the laws that they've just passed other countries have already done it but china's uh, only totally doing it now in recent years but what are the areas that you think they they have improved and they can improve yeah i think um, if you're looking because when we are looking at china and if you, since you're talking about how women have been uplifted i would i would have to go back little into history because uh, you know otherwise uh, if you don't look at history you don't understand the present right so in china the early i mean like in india also the early feminist movement started you know, in the late 19th century and early 20th century with this western countries and uh, ha- having all kinds of you know ideas of liberty rights and freedom all these ideas when they came to india and and china so that was the time when the early feminist movement started and there and that uh, you will find a few scholars who were actually uh so uh you know um uh, so aware that they realized even at that time that we should fight uh, you know the women should fight for uh, independent women's rights not something which the men are uh, giving us or telling us that you, because the reformers at that time were were uh, you know um, uh, also talking about women's rights and especially rights to education rights to uh, free marriage and all that and uh, but there were there were some feminists who were who actually believed in um, uh, independent women's rights the, the the whole idea was the, you know that the, the new women is taking birth you know around the may 4th movement and the new cultural movement actually uh, helped uh, spread such ideas through literature and especially among the chinese intellectuals there were journals there were so many newspapers there were 
uh, you know, uh, even uh, those uh, small you know, um, pamphlet sort of thing which was distributed and of course there were journals with the new youth and so many uh, journals of new women. There were so many uh, 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 intellectuals who actually brought out their ideas in, on, on women. Uh, on rights basically not women but rights and with that with rights came women's rights and you know and that's how the certain words which were not even there in in, in, in chinese language came into being even though the character for her was not there like, there was no she in, in in chinese language and the requirement of creating such a character was not because uh, women uh, need a voice was mo amongst the reformers especially was more because the Western, uh, you know, theories and the Western uh, literary works were to be translated into Chinese. And it was during this translation that there were a lot of, uh, you know, obstacle uh, that the translators uh, who were basically the intellectuals faced because there's no word for she in Chinese language. And that's how the creation of uh, she, that is ta, <coughs> came into being. And it was also debated and it was not... Uh, easily accepted there were so many people who actually objected to such a to the creation of such a word saying that it is something which is uh, not uh, uh, as for the chinese culture or whatever so there were so many i mean it's interesting like you know looking at history and how things started so the, uh, so basically what happened was uh, with this whole uh, movement like after the may 4th movement there's this whole idea of feminism and the fact that women should fight for their rights and education is very important and all these things got spread. But then, you know, with uh, Japanese invasion and communist uh, party, the, the communist party was formed and and uh, uh, communist party was actually not just formed, it was actually spread its tentacles throughout China and it could do that because of the, you know, uh, Japanese invasion, people suffering and they, it was... Uh, Therefore, people got involved uh, in, in saving them, in, in protecting themselves from the Japanese they, you know, with the, in, uh, and joining the Communist Party. So the Communist Party actually, uh, you know, uh, laid down the foundation of a Marxist, uh, you know, uh, Marxist understanding of women's liberation that was like uh, women's liberation. So there on, it was no more called feminism or feminist uh, movement in China than it was called the women's liberation movement, which was advocated by the Communist Party of China. Now, the ideological guidance uh, behind this movement or behind such a uh, movement for women was like uh, uh, women's liberation is not something separate. It has to be in sync with people's liberation, which was advocated by the Chinese masses. So therefore, it, it, it is like, uh, you know, it, it has to mix with the, with the rail track of the entire Chinese, uh, uh, you know, community as a, uh, as, as the whole community moving towards liberation and therefore women will also, and therefore women will also come and join this particular track. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example for India, like, for example, when the freedom movement was happening, the freedom uh, 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 you know, the Indian reformers and the Indian, Indian freedom fighters were, uh, were uh, you know, fighting for freedom from Britishers, right? So at that time, all the issues related to women, even, you know, there were women who were suffering from, you know, whatever, domestic violence and all that. But, you know, the movement actually embraced women who were coming out of their house and all that, but then they were not fighting for women's rights separately. They were saying that, let us first get even from the Britishers. The Britishers will not decide what will happen to our women. We will decide. So whether what is uh, whether divorce should be allowed, even when uh, say some uh, cases where divorce uh, uh, where divorce women were criticized because they took divorce from the British government. I mean from the from the British government legal system. So uh, therefore, similarly in China, uh, uh, even though in, in India post independence definitely there was uh, the idea of independent feminist movement was. Uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, was very much there, but in China, the there was no independent feminist movement. Everything was again uh, merged with the people's uh, liberation movement, and that you know, it was it became as part of the Marxist uh, uh, agenda. And for the first, the first particular uh, for this women's liberation movement, the first step was for women's employment. So everyone should start working. 
and therefore the speed with which the socialism of women uh, in china occurred like you know the, it was unprecedented in the entire world because during the 50s itself women widely participated in uh, in social production and uh, they could uh, aspire for equality within the nation before this they were stuck in the feudal system right so and they were now incorporated in the legal system this one of the first law that was you know passed by the chinese government was the marriage law uh, and therefore uh, you know it it it, 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 uh, it uplifted women from the traditional concept uh, the whole idea of women so it uplifted women in in, in literacy social status and you know, work force participation and so but uh, again you know that you know there was a culture of revolution of 10 years which was a complete chaos and in during this period it was the the idea of women's liberation then again was twisted into something like the men and women are the same and uh, in the uh, then this will iron girls uh, where women were treated like iron girls they are not as as good as men in whatever they think they were going to do this was one of the slogans that uh, mao had given now this actually derailed uh, the existing work that was going on now when i said that uh, women uh, was coming into work participation meaning that uh, the all china women's federation which was of course uh, set up by the government and it was like a connection between the government and the uh, people uh, especially women grassroots women so they had they had spread their tentacles everywhere in the smallest village every province every uh, uh, region actually uh, carrying out their grassroots level so therefore uh, the participation the political participation of women was very uh, was was quite widespread but as you said in the leadership level Uh, as we go up it's like a pyramid <clears throat> so w- without a top of course the pyramid does not have a uh, upper top because there's no one who's actually ever uh, you know been the president or even been a member of the standing committee it's like all men in black and uh, so therefore i mean we have a few uh, to name who have ever been vice premier to uh, vice premier so therefore uh, there was this uh, uh, in the post uh, cultural revolution when we, now that is when during the reforms uh, actually uh, it, it all hell broke and all the all, all the system that the communist party had set up of actually creating these uh, policies or these uh, ideas of equality between men and women were actually uh, you know um, uh, actually uh, had a huge setback because after the reforms it was all a profit orientation people uh, everything was as for the profit so employing women they realize that employing women is not very profitable also because uh, uh, you know women will get pregnant they will have they will take leave and all those ideas of you know they, they just resurged itself so the earlier understanding was then question the understanding of women's liberation that with economic liberation can women actually be liberated all those ideas were questioned now so this was a time during the 80s and 90s when everything was looked at with a new uh, kind of an understanding and the market was of course biased uh, gender bias and actually market being gender bias was also again supported somehow indirectly supported by government policies where they actually came out with labor contract system where of course they were trying to break the iron ball because everyone was employed under the government before and now with this labor contract system it's not that everybody will everyone can take for will be taken will take it for granted that they will have a job so therefore they had to be under this contract and so the new labor also uh, the new labor law acknowledged the difference between men and women till now it was like men and women are same but now they it acknowledged uh, uh, the uh, difference between men and women and they had a protectionist attitude towards women by by saying that you know there will there will be some protective legal order demanding the recruitment of women should have certain basic facilities in the uh, uh, the employer should give them certain basic facilities so this was easily misinterpreted and also misused by employers not to employ women so therefore there were so many women who actually were retrenched and they lost their jobs but you know uh, they were still working so the idea of women working was is so deep rooted in in china that you know even after they lose their formal employment they'll get into informal employment and even today the trend is continuing of actually uh, you know um, uh, lo- women lo- go- losing out from their form- formal employment and going to co- uh, informal employment or 
women being subordinated while recruitment or even uh, discriminated while recruitment all these things are continuing but still i would say that in the last it is I mean, not not just me that there so many experts who believe that the last uh, decade has been a very you know low uh, phase for women's movement or for uh, you know uh, in, in the history of entire you know especially in the with it's like a downfall i mean which is perhaps a bit different from other countries because uh, no one started so early and perhaps they are coming to the levels of other countries and then uh, the change uh, would perhaps be more uh, it's not like a it's not like a uh, forced upon change it's more like the natural change which is coming with the fight and the struggle so therefore uh, you know um, one would say that you know there are like why am i saying it's a low tide in women's movement because their policies like as you said the uh, you know uh, absence of women in leadership position is also because women are uh, women have a different age uh, of the that right they retire early so uh, generally a person would le- uh, uh, reach a leadership position at a very late in, in his or her life like maybe after 50s right and women are to retire in 55 and therefore this policy this rule is not even getting i mean it's not uh, no, nobody wants uh, it wants to change this even in spite of the fact that there's so much of pressure but uh, nobody wants to change it the men especially because then uh, it's a clear road for them to get to the leadership position because women will retire so that's also one of the reason and uh, of course in some places like universities and all these policies are changing so the the retirement age has changed recently but uh, there are these open policies of discrimination you know and you reach to the earlier one as i said retirement there are these male bias policies for enrolling in rural women universities you might have heard i don't know these simply there's been a lot of uh, talk going on and uh, uh, the education ministry has with this lot of agitation with a lot of uh, you know um, especially in social media there's a lot of discussion on uh, how uh, some of the uh, you know like uh, i would say some of this military national defense engineering science and technology women are uh, either there's a quota there's a limited quota for women or they're not even allowed to apply so uh, even though uh, recently the uh, ministry has announced to roll back this quota system but uh, there has been no uh, there's been no action taken on it's just a, a partial roll back or maybe temporary because the yeah, going, the uh, two sessions are going to happen so the new regulation uh, uh, is only partial so uh, it, it is not actually uh, even now there are so many institutions where women cannot apply and then there are so many employment where uh, uh, you know they they openly advertise that men um, sorry women are uh, we don't take women so the the kind of job the nature of job uh, does not require a woman to apply or if a woman is applying for men it will be bachelors and for women it will be M- a masters qualification the minimum qualification to apply so and even in kau kau uh, 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 the um, you know university entrance examination that is there it's a national level entrance examination so uh, in, uh, you know the main uh, there is a main quota like they have less qualifying marks that the, the qualifying marks for men is lesser than the qualifying marks for women for certain universities in this entrance exam so there are these open uh, you know discrimination and the story goes on like for some female graduates you might see so many articles so many people uh, i mean they proper uh, you know uh, news reports and also of course news uh, uh, media uh, the social media um, uh, you know uh, uh, articles or the whatever the people blogs on how uh, female graduates are, are openly discriminated against even when if they are called to the interview and they are you know uh, rejected some uh, pretext or the other that there's a lot of traveling so you will not be able to do it or something sometimes they don't even give any pretext so it's not surprising that the increasingly the government and the all china women's federation uh, is actually encouraging women to take up familial roles in, in you know being a good wife and a mother you know, and have a good sitting thing uh, he had said that you know women should embrace their unique role in the family and shoulder responsibilities of taking care of the old and the young as well as educating children so this is uh, something what shifting things said in 
so the uh, the whole uh, emergence of leftover women is also uh, part of this whole stigmatizing women who do not marry or fulfill the social roles and uh, 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 the, the government takes it upon themselves to worry because they think that these women who are highly educated if they don't get married because if they, they do get married and they have children that means the future of china uh, will have a good breed even that kind of a thinking is there so therefore in a new globalized world when there should be there are increasing opportunities and facilities and so therefore the government should make it easier for women to do both you know work and have children but the leadership is reducing women to traditional gender roles increasing pulling them back home yes ma'am um uh, you were mentioning about the the chinese character for the word she wasn't really there for a long time and that that really uh, is very interesting to me because um we know that the chinese culture when we look at it it's it's always about uh, the the men in the family and looking at how powerful they are and and subordinating women as much as possible because um in in linguistics and semantics um, ma'am you you lived in china for four years from what i saw in your bio when you, when you communicate with um, the chinese person uh, i think language is the way in which a person thinks so when when we speak to such people who have uh, have words like shangnu which refers to leftover women it's difficult to change their mindset beyond that so um, do you think these notions will change ma'am and do you think uh, the the language and the way in which they refer to women who make independent choices will change in the years to come uh i don't know if you're just asking about change then definitely it is going to be difficult like we can see that in india also like there's so many uh um uh, stereotypes on women and it's very difficult uh to say that it will change in near future but uh the the fact that people are fighting against it and they are choosing to challenge i think that is something which uh, would lead to change because the change uh you know uh, i mean if if you talk more chinese society it, it carries certain unique features you know like india india indians have uh, and of course as per their religion or the region they are living sometimes some things which are uh, for example like i am from kerala and in kerala there are certain things which women can uh, uh, do very easily perhaps and the same thing would uh, would perhaps be outrageous in in, in delhi or in, in in north indian culture so uh, therefore every every culture every uh, community have some something unique and this unique feature is not something that has uh, uh, that has come overnight or has come in a few years it's 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 been there developed in centuries right so therefore it's uh, going away um, i think it's going to take time definitely so we have to keep working towards it like if you're looking at china then i would say that you know i mean maybe again i'll go back to history once again so if you're looking at china then the unique features uh, uh, of chinese people as such and and here i'm not trying to categorize because you cannot actually categorize such a huge country to one particular term called chinese people but uh, the larger culture uh, you know uh, uh, we should understand uh, uh, the culture of chinese people and that is how we will know that uh, where the, uh, where does that uh, those ideas come from and uh, how can that be uh, you know maybe changed or corrected or whatever. so i think it's a sociology first we have to look at first we have to understand because the change uh, is is quite uh, is something which everyone can do at their own level right we cannot change nobody can change an entire society they have to it is a it is a natural evolution by which they would change but when we are looking it's very important for us to understand that why do chinese uh, people think or behave the way they they do right so i think uh, we have to look at the sociology of china that is of chinese people sociology of chinese people means the way they uh, think that is the social causes and the consequences what are the causes and the consequences and the of human behavior how how they behave and what why do they behave such way and what what would be the consequences so there are some basic principles that every chinese would follow like we know that every indian or every in india it's quite even more complex so let me know 
uh, say, but then largely, you know, mostly many of the Chinese people would follow certain certain um, ideas uh, or principles, which is part of their collective consciousness. Because as uh, the uh, centuries goes by, it becomes part of their collective consciousness, and they are deeply influenced by it. In China, they say it is the three pillars uh, of Chinese philosophy which influence them, like the Taoism, Buddhism, and uh, Confucianism. But then, like for example, Taoism is basically uh, looking at the uh, 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 it influences the uh, development and uh, uh, of, of Chinese culture, culture and the psychology. We can say you know there's so many examples like harmony, genuineness, longevity, and all that. When Buddhism is something which came from outside, it's a religion uh, which came from China, but it 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 held it actually made firm roots in China. So it's more connected to the the religious and the ritual part or the spiritual part of 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 the Chinese people. However, it was a Confucius doctrine which was basically uh, looking at the uh, the way of life, the the material life of the pre-modern society. Like, what are the type Guiding uh, principles to live in your life. Right? So therefore, and then later on in modern China, the communist revolution challenged and disrupted these existing uh, views. But then uh, the feudal, uh, you know, uh, social stratification, the, the communist uh, uh, revolution actually challenged it and raised these uh, 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 people who were actually uh, in the feudal system. They were the deprived ones or the marginalized ones. The communist revolution came and raised them above their level, right? The peasants and the workers, they were raised. But uh, there are few features, uh, like in communist, uh, 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 communist set, set up of uh, understanding, there are features of selflessness. Now, the selflessness is is uh, is the same. Uh, one should not be one should be selfless, right? That is the idea that the communist. Doctrine would uh, uh, would believe it believes in the Taoist idea of detachment and you know uh, it, it critiques the self-interest. So therefore, uh, there's a collective uh, collectivist idea that it, that it's a community of that collective community, and therefore because of this uh, collective community, that the idea of serving the group before you serve yourself that is there very very deeply embedded. That we should serve the group, typically, serve, better serve the group um, than serve yourself. Therefore, group interest is placed above self-interest. Now, with this comes the uh, idea of selflessness, and this was again, even though in the old oldest or traditional ideas, as I explained, that this was the norm. And then later on, with the, in modern China, during the communist China, also. The same uh, collectivist interest, because as you know, communism is all about collective interest and collective authority, collective rule, and therefore uh, women's liberation was seen as part of this collective, uh, you know, uh, enhancement, emancipation of human beings, not emancipation of just women. So it has to be part of this whole uh, agenda. Uh, it cannot be uh, women's interest or women's rights cannot be separate from collective interest. Like in the West, like we can see in the West, the feminist movement was always seen as a as an independent movement to fight for women's rights. But uh, in China, that was never there, you know, and even was there for a few years. But then later on, it, everything matched well with the traditional ideas also. So the self in Chinese society is like deeply embedded in these social relationships that people have. Emotionally, they are tied to their personal obligation as a uh, you know, wife, mother, uh, daughter, and therefore, the uh, the Confucian representation of keeping the family as the center of the traditional, you know, Chinese society was given so much of importance. And uh, you, you know, this the three cardinals uh, uh, that the uh, the uh, the ruler would rule the people, and the father would guide the son, and the wife would guide the husband would guide the wife. Sorry, I just said why people has been that has been ideal. Anyway, so uh, so th this is the general trend. So if we look at the, these three cardinals, we will know all the relationships in China, all the kind of relation because the ruler is guiding the, the people. So therefore, the ruler is the greatest patriarch, right? 
Now, if we, if we start with husband and wife, then signifying the, it signifies the subordinated status of women, right? And therefore, uh, men, uh, all women, all women is subordinated to all men, and they have to be independent to agree, uh, obedient, sorry, to interview. So this establishes the gender power relations from the house itself, from and legitimizes the subordinated status of women, right? Now, language, as you just mentioned, that language has all along been uh, uh, the, the, the you know the integral tool to establish uh, uh, anything, like the culture or uh, you know social structure and everything. And in this case, it has it was it is all always used as an integral tool to establish the gender power relations. And, and uh, therefore, it, it essentially shows how gender is truly constructed. In the, now, today, when we look at the traditional society, language is a very good tool for us to learn that how gender was constructed in the traditional society throughout the history. Right. So now, Chinese language. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, everyone knows about the fact that Chinese language is like filled up of examples of words and phrases where uh, you know there is a women radical which. That the, and the uh, women, the word for women itself is uh, something which is you know women kneeling down, uh, the kneeling down pose of submission, and the women radical is used uh, uh, for so many uh, you know uh, uh, words which uh, depicts uh, several um, stereotypes on women or abuses traditional and superstitious beliefs, folk culture. All of these things women are used. There are around, I think, 250 words where uh, you know women radically is used. And uh, the, the 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 tradition of gender bias in society, uh, we can, as as I said, we can look at uh, in the language. Now, uh, in general, also every language, if we're talking about any language, not just Chinese, every language is gendered in a few way. In a, you can look at the pattern, like how they are gendered. One that in some languages they say they, women have a separate language. They speak in a certain way. They have to use certain words which men don't use, or they don't use the words that men are using. It could be abusive word, or it could be some uh, you know uh, uh, respect. Women have to use the standard language using more respect. And there are some languages like in Japanese language there are. Uh, there are words especially for women, even in Japanese, even for me, I is, is different for men and women. And, uh, uh, and so it, uh, that is one, there is separate language for women. Then there is a stereotyping of how women talk or how women should talk. You know, she should talk in a, you know, whatever, very uh, uh, quiet manner. She should not shout and, and uh, things like that. And then there is a mocking of of the way women speak, and there are certain characters, words, abuses, phrases, derogatory meanings, and you know, ridiculing women or women's identity to their family, reducing women to their identity of their family and social roles, and stereotyping them to be weak, gentle, caring, pure, and relating words like purity and chastity with them. Now, uh, uh, there are so many, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you know that Chinese character is a, a pictographic script. Now, there are two parts in Chinese character. One is, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the medical part and then the meaning part. So, basically, the etymology and the applications of all these characters, they, they basically, uh, you know, uh, are descriptive of uh, of uh, what of the ideas on women, as I said, the stereotyping or reducing them. I have a lot of examples which I can give you later, where uh, the, the the women radical is used to ridicule or to you know, abuses and all that. Now, coming to the patriarchal structure of the society, we therefore, as I mentioned, I'm, I just started explaining about this uh, one. Uh, part of that uh, whole structure that is men and women. But if you look at the entire society, it is, it is a patriarchal structure. Like I just said that uh, men are dominating the women, then the elder men are dominating the younger men because the, the sons have to be filial to the fathers. And then it is the, uh, the whole entire society uh, dominated by the ruler, right? So there's a patriarchal structure uh, in the Chinese society, and th and therefore it's, they say that it is the order 
which actually uh, uh, predominates rules in the society. So, therefore, filial piety is very important. Filial piety at every level, whether it is uh, the ruler, uh, the, the the subject level, the uh, younger men or sons or the women, they have to be filial to uh, all uh, their, their uh, females. So, therefore, that is how the order is maintained. And therefore, even to till today, they say that. Uh, um, you know, the state and the party exists as the top patriarch and the patriarchal control of the families are extended to uh, these associational networks within the, you know, kinship or the relation people have with each other. So the political culture of China, on the one hand, they say that, it, uh, you know, um, the, the sociologists uh, claim that, you know, the Chinese are regarded as this, this particular community which would culturally be inclined to accept authoritarian rule you know, a collective uh, moral norm, because everyone should be, I mean, I cannot individually claim that, you know, I don't like this government, so I want to change it. It's a collective uh, sort of uh, well-being that is being with that first. However, in the recent years, in, in, con in contrast to this, or critiquing this particular idea, in the recent years, we've also seen how, uh, like I just mentioned, there have been so many uh, uh, dissents, there have been so many people who are actually uh, trying to uh, root out this uh, 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 the resurfacing of these traditional ideas of uh, authoritarian rule. And uh, uh, we have also witnessed the emergence of a public sphere. It's like right from the May 4th movement, we can see the emergence of public sphere in the present day. It's continually, as you said, it's a flux. Like there are newspapers, think tanks, even saloons, cafes, or bookstores, literally journals, or Everywhere there are uh, discussions, and uh, you know it's, it's, it's mushrooming. And now with the internet and social media, there is no there is no control. The, the state is not able to directly control them, and therefore uh, 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 there is a social space for women to reach out, to reach out to uh, to, to their own people, to the larger domestic and the international audiences and uh, express their uh, uh, issues and, and also spread awareness amongst each other. Now to name a few of these, as we, as we know, the Me Too movement, and then there is this uh, say no to menstru menstrual shame. Because recently there was this, uh, you know, as I said, with that uh, Wuhan incident, and the, there were many people openly speaking about, uh, our, our, you know, even though they are uh, having their periods, but they have to work in two shifts, they have to work like 18 hours and they don't get rest. And then this discussion went on and on and on and there were so many people, there were men who were discussing and then it was it was known that there are so many men who actually don't know what exactly it means. Some people believe that, you know, it is something that one can stop and it is something that is blue, it is shown in the advertisement. And there's so many things that, uh, there is so many, increasingly there is so many discussions. I haven't seen any such discussions in Indian uh, social media. I don't know, just correct me if I'm wrong. But in China, there have been so many open discussions on uh, on, on menstrual cycle. Or, 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 I'm not I'm not ashamed uh, to say that I'm uh, uh, having my periods. Or, uh, and there's been, so the, these uh, campaign and these kind of, uh, you know, discussions are increasingly vibrant in in, in China. Yeah, and recently, the recent example is also when uh, there was this, uh, you know, most recently there was this women's, uh, you know, activist who actually came together and appealed to the NPC you know, during the two session to, to abolish this pro-men quota in, in universities and in, in the people. So these are all examples of you know choose to challenge. It's very interesting, ma'am, because my next question was going to be about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, my question was, uh, basically, I framed it in a way where I was going to ask you if they're going to successfully rebel the patriarchy that exists within, the, the, within China. And my, my, my feeling was that they've probably internalized the misogyny and they've become unperturbed uh, by this century old gender bias that's there in the society but from what you just mentioned about uh, women being open enough to talk about menstrual cycles I mean we still in India we still yeah. struggle to talk openly about it so I find that very interesting uh, they're actually opening up and talking about these uh, these things so uh, my, my next question is and my final question is 
uh, when we compare the status, because you've done a lot of uh, comparative study between China and India and the West as well. I wanted to just ask you, ma'am, about uh, when we compare the status between uh, the status of women in China with other countries, especially in uh, in in the Indo-Pacific region. We see that China is uh, the the diaspora, and we see that there are people who have migrated to other uh, Southeast Asian countries, and that they have their presence there. And do you think that um, the civil society and the cross-cultural intermixing uh, with other uh, other societies can help? Uh, in building better representation and participation for women in China, like what what do you see that to turn out to be? Uh, I think if you're looking at Indo-Pacific, or generally if you're looking at Asian countries, because Indo-Pacific would include a large canvas with some countries being developed countries and Western, uh, you know, oriented or Western countries, you can say. But uh, I think Asian uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, more or less have the same similar uh, you know traits of traditional conservative ideas on women or stereotypes on women so the civil society can definitely play a role I and mean, women is also part of the civil society uh, to, uh, for a better participation of women and as i said it, it is a it is a it has to be the gradual change in the mindset of the people as long as people are going to uh, you know divide uh, uh, gender uh, or divide labor right let's say division of labor in a gendered way then they will there's going to be a problem because everything starts from home if if you if if uh, you know if we have to stop talking about do we ever say that you know we always say that oh my husband or my uh, boyfriend he helps a lot at home and he really helps me a lot and you know my father uh, helps my mother a lot but when a woman is working, we don't say that uh, she's helping her. She's helping her husband earning you know, to earn some extra bucks, or she's helping. Uh, she's part of the income of the house. And so what we have to do, we have to stop doing. Uh, we have to stop uh, putting everything into boxes. There's nothing like women's work and men's work, right? It, it's it's a matter of uh, everyone doing their part. Right, and now we have to decide what is their part. That that individual will decide. It's not that if this is women's work, therefore I cannot do, and this is men's work, and therefore I cannot do. I'm not just challenging women's work. I'm also challenging men's work. It should not be like men should be go out, should be going out, and as uh, you know, we've seen during the COVID-19 that men felt that they are stronger and they were not wearing masks, or they were the ones who were braving out and getting the groceries. And in China, it was interesting, and I saw this article where. Uh, this woman writes that you know she she took pictures of these men calling their mothers or their wives that which one should I buy is it this one or is it that one and they were showing the video so because uh, it's obvious that they were not doing this before right and now with the COVID it's understood it's taken for granted that men are stronger so they should go out they should brave out whereas if you see all the figures it's the men who have contracted the virus more than women. And um, it, it, it's just taken for when men feel that you know that wearing a mask is a sign of weakness, or staying back at home and letting the women go and do this is, is a sign of weakness. In you know, let's you become a lesser man. Like in, in a very interesting article, like uh, one of the nurse when she was going uh, to Wuhan, which is uh, uh, there were so many uh, nurses who were sent from other provinces to help out in Wuhan. So this nurse, uh, she says that, you know, when I was going, my husband told me that I don't want anything. I just want you to come back safely and I will cook for uh, for you for another year. For one more year, I will cook for you after you come back. And she says that, OK, then I will uh, I'll teach you. So these are the stereotypes that, you know, it just gets there's no end to them. And I'm not saying that women should not be the one who's cooking or men should not be the one who's cooking, but then there are these stereotypes. There's no that the understanding has to be like whoever is, whoever can, whoever is doing should, can, should be able to do, it. right? And it's not that I mean we've seen COVID-19 during the COVID-19 period, women have been, uh, you know, the the worst sufferers in, at every level because staying back at home with all the members at home with no help. Uh, like earlier, uh, there were the, the maids, or because of the maids, there was this false sense of equality because the maid was doing and the women were also doing, but then mostly maid were. 
So there was this false sense of equality at home also, which was all broken during this uh, uh, lockdown when people were like you know, literally caged inside the house. So I think uh, it has to start from home while bringing up a girl. We should not be uh, m making her realize at every step that she's that she's been given certain facilities in spite of the fact that she's a girl. So all the all these are just reiteration of tradition, and and, and sh she uh, would be put in a space where she would feel guilty or privileged. I think both are wrong. So uh, I think as for cross cultural mixing, um, yeah, I mean there's so many Chinese women who have uh, gone overseas and they end up marrying uh, uh, women uh, or men from from mainland China and then they have a new culture, they establish a new culture, and not not just for Chinese. I think it's there for every every culture. Even if when you marry uh, from within India, like for example, I have married someone not from Kerala, and then our daughters have. Uh, my daughter has something like uh, a mixed culture. There's no set kind of norm at home. That this is the culture that we follow, and that happens. Uh, that also reduces a lot of stereotyping uh, at home, you know? and uh, therefore the standard norms of gender power relations as well as gender uh, social gender, which which is generally followed, can be broken with these, with these uh, cross cultural uh, relations or intermixing, as you said. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a long way to go. It's a long struggle, and uh, as long as we we are uh, we are choosing to challenge or we keep fighting, uh, we will uh, because everything starts at our level and then it gets spread. Right? So therefore, I think in China, uh, I would say that Chinese women are increasingly more and they're much more aware in the. In spite of uh, the socio-cultural political uh, scenario, they are um, um, many of them are choosing to challenge. And many of them are perhaps not choosing to challenge now, but they will at some point in time. Uh, as in uh, in other parts of the world, I think it's a slow process. Something at least at least the, the internet and the social media has actually uh, made so many things happen. Like. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the last example. Like before, uh, this new generation of the internet generation, that is the '90s generation. Uh, you know, before this, the women activists in China or the uh, women's liberation activists or the feminist activists were were doing things, uh, were negotiating, were trying to uh, make sense with whatever uh, the party was. Uh, in, in, uh, were allowing them or were asking them to do, and then within that structure, within that framework, there were a lot of work going on to to bring up the women, especially from the grassroots level. However, with the new generation, the young uh, generation of feminists, there is this uh, uh, entirely uh, new um, and uh, exactly opposite uh, uh, you know, uh, methods of you know displaying of of. Uh, um, Displaying one's uh, protest, it's no more under closed uh, uh, setup. It's now displayed. It's all out there in the social media. Even if it's taken down, but it comes back. So there is no dearth of protest in the social media. So yeah. that's a that's a very um, uh, that's a very um, optimistic uh, step. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, from history to politics to uh, economic and social and cultural and linguistics, I think you've covered so much around uh, in this uh, 45 minute to one hour. I think it's been so enlightening. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the time that you've uh, you've, uh, you've uh, scheduled and you've just come in and you've spoken so much about women in China. And I just want to say thank you once again, ma'am. I deem it a privilege to have interviewed you today. Um, I also want to uh, thank um, C3S Director uh, Commodore R.S. Parson for giving me this opportunity to interview you today, ma'am. Thank you so much for this uh, interview. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I think it's a it's a very good forum to actually uh, explore. And I've seen your website, and I think you're doing a very good job. And 
So thank you, ma'am. Uh, you've all, you've you've contributed so much to China, and I just wanted to uh, thank you so much for highlighting women's issues. Uh, and I've I've read some of your articles on Shangnu and uh, on COVID nineteen, and it's brilliant, ma'am. Thank you so much for the content and everything that you write on China. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, you ma'am. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am.